welcome the famous Brad Huddleston with us today. Thanks, man. Appreciate you. Famous. I asked the people in the first service, anybody old enough to remember that TV show called Hee Haw? My town was saluting at Cornfield three times, okay? <laughs> so it's not that big of a deal. Um, it's so good to be here. And when I say that, you know, it's obligatory for guest speakers to say that. I actually mean it. I do. Um, we had great fellowship last night. And the Lord is, is truly doing something special at this church. I get around to a lot of churches, obviously. And in general, the churches in our country here are, are suffering. Uh, churches decline tend, attendance, and there's the big battle that's going on theologically for a number of cultural reasons. But it's been such a refreshing time here. There, the Lord is doing something special here. And the attendance is incredible, but all the hugs and the, the encouragement that I received after the first service, it's, it, I, I'm walking away. A lot of times we walk away from churches drained. So far, I'm pretty pumped up. So we love you, and thank you for having us, Pastor. Um, we are from uh, not terribly far, about six hours away down in Virginia, but this picture was taken on the southernmost tip of Africa where the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans meet. We spend a, a half of our year overseas on the mission field, and I have a skill set that gets me into countries that missionaries otherwise would not get into, and you'll see that this morning in action. Um, but then there are Christian countries to go into where you can actually start preaching on the plane if you want to, and that would be Africa. Um, and they'll just get saved anytime you want them to. Um, so it's pretty awesome. But we live about 12 miles from the Shenandoah National Park, for those of you who are familiar with that part of Virginia. I'm actually from a little bit further south, down in what used to be called the Great Valley of Appalachia. Um, so we're hillbillies. I like to say Hill Williams, because that's a high-class hillbilly. It's a Hill William, yes. I've climbed off my mountain and got me some education, and this went right back up. That's right. And I often have to tell people, Beth is not my cousin, so let's just get that. <laughs> I went outside of my family. My family's not attractive, so, um, <laughs> so y'all get that and apparently not offended. That's good. I often say this, too. Um, it's going to get heavy in here. <laughs> it, it, it is. And someone famous once said, make them laugh or they will kill you. <laughs> the exit is a long way. You know, if I get too heavy... I'm convinced, and I have no theological basis for this, none whatsoever. It's just what I think, which is probably dangerous. But I think when I get too intense, God plays jokes on me in an effort to calm me down. Let me give you an example. I am a pretty easygoing guy. Love humor, um, except when I'm in line. I hate standing in line. Now, on the outside, I look like a preacher, but the inside, I'm feral. You know what feral means? I'm a feral mongrel. And I hide it very well. And so Beth and I were at this restaurant. It was a buffet, pizza buffet. And I'm standing there waiting. And as I'm looking at these people, I'm thinking, would you hurry up? Oh, just stop picking over the stuff and take it. <laughs> and I'm not saying anything. I'm smiling. But inside, I'm like, oh, that's the piece I wanted. Why did you take that? <laughs> and while I was trying to overcome my boredom and my angst from standing in line, I reach over and I grab her. And I'm giving her a back rub. And I'm rubbing her neck. And when I looked, it wasn't Beth. <laughs> true and I looked at her ah! <laughs> and there's a sweet little lady and I went ma'am I am so sorry I was not sexually harassing you <laughs> and she looked at me and she goes it's okay honey I was enjoying it <laughs> I'm not even Catholic but hey <laughs> I was relieved so if I get too intense um I may fall off the stage or knock this thing <laughs> over or something it's the Lord going settle down boy settle down so as we travel all over the world and I do research, um, we spend a lot of time in, in Australia. In fact, we leave in two weeks, and I'll spend three months in Australia. Next year, probably six. And then from there, we'll go into Australasia. But when we're in Africa, one of my stops is at the University of South Africa. I am part of their Bureau of Market Research and the Consumer Neuroscience Laboratory attached to it. And what I do, the, the smart people are on either side of me. As I go into all these auditoriums and schools around the world and talk to all these people, I spend a lot of time with students, thousands every year, speaking to them, and we do uh, research as well. And we identify the trends and things that are bubbling up. For example, one year, as we were doing these surveys amongst thousands of kids in Australia, by the way, Australia 
The reason why a lot of the reason we spend so much time there is because they're way ahead of the rest of the world in implementation of the devices into the school systems. So the first one-to-one -one laptop and tablet program happened in 1989 in Melbourne, Australia. You may know it as Melbourne, but there we say Melbourne. So um, it's, it's Microsoft has mentoring schools there where they test the hardware and software, and I've spoken at two of their schools. So they're ahead of the curve in implementation. Now, that's not a compliment. Uh, there was a time when some of these places wouldn't have somebody like me, but it's not gone well. And so what I'm trying to do is warn the other countries that it's not gone well in the place that started a lot of this. Um, and, and it's going, I, I'm, I'm busy speaking. I can't say that everyone likes me, um, but I, I think they like me, but the message itself is a bit convicting. But again, God will throw me off the stage or something if I get too intense. Uh, but the smart people in the lab are these folks. So I identify these trends and then I make proposals uh, to have research done. And if it can be funded and all that sort of stuff. And then they make it palatable for me to understand so that I can come and write about it and, and tell you about it. So what we are technically, if you really want to know the truth, we're missionaries. So I've been to Bible school. I also have a, a degree in computer science. And the, hence, that's where all the technology comes in. And my burden to undo what many of us who started in this a long time ago, inadvertently, who bought into it and promoted it, now we're having to backpedal some a lot. So... I work with law enforcement in Australia as well, and they open a lot of doors for me to get into the public system and the private system as well to do this research, and we see the back end of that where the students and so forth have been groomed. Um, all kinds of horrible things are going on with bullying and the suicidal ideations and things like that. So uh, it's a real privilege for me to spend time with them. And because we're missionaries, I would normally, as a Christian missionary, never get in somewhere like this. Uh, but because I have this skill set, these folks invite me, and I, I gladly go in and, and do my very best to help them. So what I want to do is give you today the same diagnostic criteria that I would give in a hospital. So this is a friend of mine uh, who runs the emergency department of a very large hospital in Australia, and uh, he brings me in, and I speak to the senior doctors and nurses, and then I speak to the doctors, uh, the residents. We call them, you're in residence here, they call them junior doctors there. And I'm just going to go over between this morning and tonight the very same diagnostic criteria that as I would talk to the doctors about so that when they come into the emergency department and or the ambulances are sent out and the children are presenting with certain symptoms and they're a bit baffled, then it, we investigate the digital side of it that could, could be causing the problem. And I'm very privileged to still be on the radio <laughs> and television, just in a much larger capacity now. I have a radio show. Uh, called TechWise. It runs every day. It's a 90-second clip talking about all these things I'm talking to you about, and it's five days a week, and it runs all over the world. So then I pop into the studios around the world and do the, the elongated interviews as well. So I wrote this book, Digital, uh, The Dark Side of Technology, rather, about 15 years ago. It's out of print now, and uh, at the table, the, mo the more current books, I just updated this one, is Digital Cocaine, and then this is a clinical look at digital rehabilitation. And there's some other things out there that Beth will be more than happy to help you with. What I want to do is show you a couple of funny things. And I'm going to actually have you experience dopamine. So how many of you know what dopamine is? So most everybody by now knows what dopamine is. So I'm going to have you look at a screen. Pretty odd coming from somebody like me. <laughs> but I'm not going to give you enough dopamine to get you addicted. You probably already came in here addicted. So don't blame this on me, okay? So <laughs> So a couple of videos that are just funny. What I want you to do is just enjoy them. That's it. And then I'm going to walk you through the brain and what happens when our eyes lock onto a screen and we get too much dopamine. So for now, just enjoy Trunk Monkey. The Trunk Monkey Theft Retrieval System. Because sometimes getting your car back is simply not enough. Another revolutionary idea you'll only find at Suburban Auto Group, pending approval by Department of Agriculture. These are real car commercials. I thought they were very, for the first month I watched them, I had no idea what they were advertising. <laughs> so what? Show me another one. So uh, here's another one. Here we are. I still can't believe my dad let us even touch his new car. Oh, yeah? 
I think it came with the car. Hey. <laughs> Wait! The Trunk Monkey Chaperone version. An innovative idea you'll only find at Suburban Auto Group. How many of you dads want one of those? That's what I thought. <laughs> we'll see if we can, can't help you out there. Now, for me, the solution to all these problems that I'll bring up today is not science. Surprisingly, it's helpful. But there's not enough power in science to free us from the magnitude of what we're actually suffering. Are, are you with me? So brain scanning and you know, neurobiology and all this, very good at pointing out the problem. And, and in a way, it can help you and point you in the direction. But I submit to you, you and I need a power that's much greater than the force of the addiction to help us out of it. And that comes from two sources. Or several sources, but the, the two that I will talk about would be the Word of God, the Holy Spirit combined with that, and God's people joining together. That's what God gave us, is, is each other. So, is it right or wrong to have technology? Well, as I mentioned to you, I have a degree in computer science, and I haven't renounced it. I have a nice new, uh, who, whose phone is that? I've written two books about you. You should consider buying them. Um, <laughs> did show it up, though. <laughs> <laughs> Happens every time. So, can we have it or can't we? I haven't renounced my computer science degree, but there is a line that we have crossed, I submit to you, especially in the body of Christ. I don't expect the world to get this, uh, the unsaved people, those that don't know Christ. But for us, we're not to be addicted to anything. And so, the main text that I would have for us this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, where the Apostle Paul writes, everything is permissible for me. So I'm using a, a brand new laptop. Um, I have a phone. It's not with me, but I have one. Um, it's okay. But not all things are beneficial. And then the line that I believe God has drawn in the sand comes from the second part of this verse. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything which means to be brought under its power, allowing it to control me. So I'm going to show you some brain scans of what it looks like when people are controlled and some video clips that illustrate that. My main burden is not the neuroscience. It is what it has done to two generations regarding their knowing or their intimacy, relationship with God's Word and God Himself. We, we find God primarily through His Word. And the biblical worldview rates for the millennials... And Gen Z is only 4%, according to the Barner Research Group. And then some shocking statistics came out recently. Mothers and dads who are millennials who are raising children only have a 2% biblical worldview rate, which means they may go to church. These are Christian research organizations, by the way. They're not transferring the Bible because they don't know it. And what is the primary reason? Well, they are enamored with the culture and they have a worldview, but it's not biblical. So when you poll them on issues of LGBTQ or any other of these things, morality that we're all struggling to get our heads around, they will favor the culture more than they will the Bible. Does that make sense? And so that's my main burden. And so what has happened is that we have entertained ourselves literally to numbness, emotional numbness, which is a medical condition called anhedonia. And it's spoken of in the scripture. In, in Ephesians 4.19, um, the church there is being chastised. You, you've lost your sensitivity. Why? Because you've given yourselves over to sensuality. So with Netflix binging, pornography, we are very sensual, you know, uh, Taylor Swift has got her Eros tour, all these things, sex, 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 sensuality. And what it's done, it has caused us to lose our sensitivity to the things that are actually important, and that would be an intimate relationship with Jesus and those areas of our heart that God has reserved for him and him alone. We have given them elsewhere. So as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. So Dr. Nicholas Cardaris runs a detox center in Texas. At the time of this filming, this, this interview was conducted in Australia, so, or 
it was an Australian news organization. I think they went to New York, up here in New York, where he previously had his detox center. And Dr. Cardaris is, is really big in the area that I deal in. Um, so he, he actually detoxes people, writes books. So he's being interviewed on an Australian network. So you hear that accent, but you'll, you'll hear him. And so at the beginning of this video clip, you're going to see children who have just had their devices taken away from them. And you already know what's going to happen. And it seems funny until you wait to the end when you see the brain scans showing why they're acting this way. It's damage. And it's severe. And then in the middle, he's going to give a more detailed explanation of dopamine. What do you want? I want an iPad. Across the globe, frustrated parents are forcing kids to go cold turkey on technology. Chicken. <laughs> Their reactions are not unlike the withdrawal symptoms of a drug addict. I know addiction when I see it, and I started seeing very clear signs of addiction in children, especially the withdrawal part. Get it back! You already lit my up on ever! The mood dysregulation when an addict gets their drug of choice taken away from them. No iPad. <laughs> the temper tantrums, the violent outbursts, we started seeing more and more of those. How are you doing, Dr. Nick? Dr. Cardaris runs an addiction clinic in New York. It was exclusively for drug addicts. Now he's seeing more and more screen addicts. As an addiction psychologist as an, and as a parent, what shocked me the most was the realization that these devices were digital heroin. No different. They were affecting the brain the same as any opiate addiction. It does two things fundamentally. It's hyper-stimulating and hyper-arousing, so it elevates our adrenal response. It's the same reward schedule as a slot machine. It keeps you playing and playing over and over again to get that dopamine tickle. The screen itself, the rapid screen cuts, the radiant light itself, the hyper-immersive effect is stimulating in a way that television never was. So what it does is it raises our dopamine levels in the way that we want to chase that dopamine uh, effect. The sounds, it's the, the achievement. Most of the games are aimed at feeling good when you actually get to the next level. Oh, it's always a reward, you it's know, the bright, yeah. sparkly light. I'm stopping it just before we get to the brain scans. If, you were to, if I were to ask you, what do you think the average global age of a video gamer is, what would you say? Just call it out. Four, nine, 14, it's 35. There are more 35-year-olds who game than 14-year-olds. And the reason is because he's a millennial, and he was the first generation to be dubbed a digital native. They were the first group that, demographically, that grew up totally immersed in a digital world. So now they've grown up, they have children, and they have immersed their children in it. And so we have a dad problem, not a teenage problem. Well, we have a teenage problem, but it's more prolific in dads than it is in children. So there are two layers of severe, severe addiction in every home. Oh, about 97% of our homes of America, that's how many game. And we're in trouble. It's happy sound. Yeah. This is a brain scan from a chronic heroin addict. Highlighted here is damage to the frontal cortex and surrounding area. It is the part of the brain that regulates behavior and impulse control. In heroin addicts, that part of the brain shrinks and becomes less dense. This is a brain scan from a teenager diagnosed with screen addiction. The damage and the effect on the brain is nearly identical. In science, in order to make a claim, it has to be repeatable. And what you'll see and gather rather quickly as I go through this, especially tonight, this is happening and showing up with different scanning technologies showing the same thing from different parts of the world. Am I making sense to you? And as a minister of the gospel of Jesus, this bothers me immensely because every kid that I meet in these auditoriums all over the world, at some level, are struggling with it. And 
I got this email from a homeschool, pretty big homeschool group I'm supposed to speak to. And they were, as they always do, they said, oh, our kids are innocent, so are you going to be careful what you say? And then the homeschool kids come to me when their parents are out of earshot, when the helicopter mom disappears, and they tell me what's really going on, because they actually have more time on devices than the ones who are in the public school if the public school has not let them have the devices. So there's all these things that are going on, and then I'm sort of stuck in the middle, because if I deal with something that they need to hear, I get in trouble with the parents, and the kids love it. You, you know what I'm saying? Ha, we got them snowed, and your hands are tied. <laughs> you won, you evil little creature. Now, <laughs> that's just a theological statement. They were born with the nature of Adam, like everybody else. That's all I mean by that. Feral little mongrels. I have no... <laughs> I have no scripture to back it up. That was just redneck. <laughs> so here's what's happening. This uh, is some, for those of you who are more scientifically inclined and you, you like to cite sources, which to me takes the joy completely out of life, citing sources. Some people really like that stuff. <laughs> I do it because you have to. That's the only reason. Now, Dr. Archibald Hart wrote a book called Thrilled to Death, How the Endless Pursuit of Pleasure is Leaving Us Numb. And he wrote it years ago. It was the first time. Well, when I, let me digress. When I wrote The Dark Side of Technology, there was only psychology, and you could punk, uh, poke holes in this very easily because you ask three psychologists the same question, you get three totally different answers. You look at a brain scan, one answer. Thank God. So Dr. Hart was the first one that actually talked about a dopaminergic response and what hyperstimulation does, etc. So I designed some brain animations based on his work. So that's where it comes from. And you should cite your sources, by the way. So this area of the brain is oversimplified. So if there's neuro people here and doctors, understand, I speak to second graders. And if I started talking about neurons and a synaptic cleft and an enzymatic barrier at the bottom of a receptor, I would, these kids would eat me alive. So cut me some slack. I made this easy to understand. And I ran this past doctors and got the thumbs up. So there. <laughs> I justified my simplicity. No, but I think it'll help you, seriously. This little area is called the nucleus accumbens of the brain, but we'll just call it the pleasure center. So when I showed you Trunk Monkey, I did that on purpose so I could illustrate to you what happens when your eyes lock onto a screen and you're entertained too much. What happens is that area is part of the reward circuit. You were rewarded with feelings of pleasure, and I knew that it worked because I heard you laughing, and I never physically tickled you. I created a change in the chemistry of your brain just like that with your eyes. So the dopamine goes in there, and you'll see it lighting up in the middle, but you'll also see a wall forming. That's those dopamine receptors at the bottom pushing out the excessive amounts of dopamine. It illustrates that. And the brain is pushing it out, trying not to get you to limit, not balance, not moderate, but stop. But we don't. So we do the activity longer, harder, and more intensely as the wall grows to get over it to continue to get our fix. Am I making sense to you? Then that's where habituation comes in at some point. It becomes a habit, then it becomes an addiction. And it works with alcohol, heroin, chocolate. Sorry I said that one. Screens, <laughs> I like chocolate too. Coffee, oh, I hate admitting that word. But it's true. So the wall gets big, and then eventually what happens is the wall gets so big, it pushes out all the dopamine, and notice that it goes gray in the middle. Keep that in mind. Emotionally, that is a medical condition called anhedonia. It's two Greek words put together, and meaning none. Hedonia is where we get our modern English word hedonism, which is the ongoing, constant pursuit of pleasure. And you put those two together, you no longer feel joy and pleasure. And it was first discovered in severe drug addicts, people with psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia. And then it started turning up in children whose parents used devices as babysitters. And those brain scans that I showed you. Now I'm going to pause for just a second. And please hear me, parents and grandparents. This is where I don't enjoy the ministry that God has given me always. I run the risk when I tell you that, knowing there are doctors probably here, probably neuro, could be neuroscientists, and I'm not lying, and they will tell you. Not exact, in fact, I'm not telling you the full story. 
but I love you. And God sent me here not to beat you with this. At the end of it, it ends positive. You trust me on that one? It's all, that wall can come down and that color can come back. That's why I came. But in order to get you there, the scripture says you shall know the truth and help me complete that. This is not a beat up. It's a free up. And God is not mad at you or me because I'm, I am previously guilty of everything I'm talking about. Especially with a degree like mine. I'm not currently guilty, but I am temp faced with the same temptation that you are every day and I could fall tonight. And I'm sincere about that. I have to guard myself and I have men in my life, all that. I do. So the goal between this morning and tonight and we'll start the process this morning. I'm not going to leave you in negative land, but it's to get that wall down and to get the color back because it is totally, totally doable. So God didn't bring you here for me to beat you up and to condemn you. He loves you. He's not mad at you, but he does miss you. Some of you. Am I making sense to you? So I am guilty in my past, and I struggle with it every day just like everyone else. A couple of other misconceptions, and then I want to, in the time that we have remaining, walk you through some of the solutions, and we'll pick it up tonight and go really deep. And Maybe God, if you still like me, <laughs> maybe at some point in the future we can do a day-long seminar like we do sometimes, and you can go even deeper. What happened, a, a church at home, I did, did a seminar like this, and then a whole bunch of families happened to go to the pastor and say, well, we, we want to do this together. And they, so they called me and said, can you work with them? And they just right up the street. And I went, well, yeah, sure. So this lady here, Dr. Victoria Dunkley, is out at UCLA. She works a lot in detox and studying what we study. She's way more, uh, <laughs> here's, a, here's a hillbilly saying, she's gooder at it than me. Um, way gooder, making them laugh so they don't kill me. <laughs> so she detoxes children, works a lot with kids on the spectrum, and there's a, a huge correlation between the autism some forms of it, ADHD, attention deficits, and screen addiction. It's being caused, in other words. There's a causal link, and it's known. But here's one of the things that we have to understand. It is essential to realize that any electronic screen interaction, regardless of the content, can irritate the nervous system. It's the medium, not the message. In the early days, I preclude it now by doing what I'm doing now, but... Parents would come to me and say, Brad, I only allow my children to use digital devices for educational purposes. I suspect they were just telling me what I wanted to hear. Then I'd have to hug them because they were well-meaning. It sounds reasonable. They're, these are not evil parents. But I'll say, what scientific evidence do you have that shows that your child's Chromebook that has mathletics on it is not just as addictive as Fortnite with the brain scans that are horrible? And they look at you bewildered. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, There is a way that seems right to man, but it ends in death. That's why we need truth. We must live, breathe, and think by the truth, not what seems right. It's like when a gamer gets mad at me. He says, I'm a gamer. I know better. <laughs> it's like saying, Mr. Coke addict, are you addicted? <laughs> no. You see the world I have to live in and negotiate. I have to deal with people's emotions when I'm going by the truth. And it's a difficult thing to do. But Jesus is on my side because he is the truth. <laughs> He's a good one to hide behind. <laughs> so anhedonia. I want to show you just a, a very practical thing that we see all the time. So I'm going to show you a video clip. There's no, there's no wait for it, wait for it, something's going to happen. It's stuff that we, I think this was even filmed in an airport. My emergency room doctor friend sent it to me, said show it. Um, so we see this in restaurants, it goes on in our homes and things like that. So you're just going to see a pretty mundane video, but nothing's going to happen. All right, then I want to make a point.
What's in her hand? So, while I don't know her, I can pretty much tell you what's happened. Pretty obvious. She's addicted to her phone. So what has happened, she's got a wall in her brain that's blocking out the dopamine. So in normal human-to-human -human interaction, last night, Jen and Pastor Dave, Beth and myself had dinner, and no phones. It's awesome. And I need that kind of fellowship. So we had dinner, and we talked, and we laughed, and we ate too much barbecue to the glory of God. And, <laughs> and the levels of dopamine were perfectly normal for satiation. And serotonin was coming in, and we had great fellowship, and they turned the light out. That was the cue that we had gone too long. Otherwise, we had probably stayed longer and ate more french fries to the glory of God. But too much ketchup and all that. And, and it's so healthy when you get together, and there's no distraction of phones. Normal amounts of dopamine. But what's happened to her, she's got a wall in her brain, and if she's not receiving enough dopamine from a hyper-stimulating activity such as her phone, anything beneath that wall's threshold of dopamine is non-stimulating, which by definition means she's bored with her child. So if you put in front of her a phone and a child, her own child, which will she take every single time? She's going to take her phone. Now, don't get mad at me. You see that everywhere, don't you? We all do. God's heart is broken because that's an orphaned child with a mother, emotionally. And we see it everywhere. I see it on planes, long-haul trips. I mean, it, and it's heartbreaking. And I don't run up to mothers and dads and grab them and shake them and smack them around. I don't do any of that. I actually have compassion on her. She needs help. And that's what Christians are supposed to do is help people. Amen? Amen? But that is anhedonic at a very deep level. And what concerns me the most, horizontally that child is suffering, but I already quoted the biblical worldview rates to you, vertically, the relationship with Jesus, even though we go to church, put our kids in Christian schools, go to youth group, they are tethered in their bedrooms with the door shut to the culture, and they have a worldview that is culture-based and not biblically-based. Therefore, they have no intimacy with God, and they're bored with Him all over the world. And that's the burden that we carry is to see that wall come down and the color to come back because it can. So let me show you some, some brain scans. We'll cover... Get the ball rolling on getting that wall down because I don't want you to walk out of here depressed and feeling beat up. Let me take your temperature. Do you still love me? That was weak. In fact, I felt the knife. I told you it was like that. I, I, that's why I don't like doing this. All the time. It's hard. It's hard. I don't want to be one of these people that make you laugh and carry on like them TV guys <laughs> and throw money at you and get to ride in the front of the plane <laughs> instead of the toilet. So these are SPECT scans, and it, it's an acronym, S-P-E-C-T, which stands for Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography. So they're CT scans for the brain. Uh, I was very ill last year, in and out of the hospital in Australia. I'd been in Thailand, and when I got to Australia, I was very, very sick for six weeks, and eventually collapsed and had to be taken to the hospital. Blood pressure was some ungodly low thing, 40-something over 70-something. Took them three days to get that back. Kidneys had been uh, injured and we're at 25% capacity, and liver was damaged and all this, and um, we think it was, well, I won't tell you what it was. <laughs> Bad mental, it's parasitic, we think. Um, probably from the jungles of Thailand, I don't know, but I got really, really sick. And the point is, is that I did what was right, and it took months 
but I did what was right, and my health came back 100%. And if you do what is right, and tonight we'll go on that journey, and we'll start it this morning, if you do what is right, that color will, will start to fire back again. I'll show you brain scans about that. That wall will come down, and your brain will return to what is called homeostasis. This is a, a baseline of a known, normal, healthy brain, of which you then scan with using SPECT scanning technology, a brain that you suspect has damage. You compare it the two, and you can clearly see. So this is someone who smokes marijuana. Now, if you were to take the brain out of the skull, it would not look like that. What you're seeing here is a measure of the blood flow, and in this case, the lack of blood flow. So they speak slowly, cognitively, they process slowly, and cocaine does the same thing just in different regions of the brain. But here's the digital link. Video gaming can be addictive in the same way as cocaine or gambling. And Dr. Cardaris, that I've already shown you the video clip of, an ever-increasing amount of clinical research correlates screen tech with psychiatric disorders like ADHD, addiction, anxiety, depression, increased aggression, I showed you that on the video, and even psychosis. Perhaps most shocking of all, recent brain imaging studies conclusively show that excessive screen exposure can neurologically damage a young person's developing brain in the same way that cocaine addiction can. That's why the cover of the book, Digital Cocaine, shows a 13-year-old snorting what appears to be a white substance off his iPhone. But if you look carefully, those are zeros and ones. But it comes from brain scans. That's not a metaphor. And I want to show you another instance of pure digital addiction. That's the normal brain. That's heroin. That drug went in through a needle. And that's the porn brain. And that drug went in through the eyes. And it's worse than the heroin brain, and clinicians will tell you it is more difficult to detox a, heroin, or a porn addict than it is a heroin addict. So what do you do? I'll pick this up tonight at length, but in order to get that wall down, you have to go through what is called a digital detox, and it's pretty straightforward. The starting point is four to six weeks. And during that time, and you have to plan it. And during that four to six weeks, you cannot have any screens at all, including television. Television does the same thing. Reading on the Kindle does the same thing. Remember, it's not the message. It's not the content. It's the medium. Now, the good news is those holes will fill in, and homeostasis will return in the brain. I want to show you something from law enforcement. We had just finished a tour in Australia with law enforcement, and my colleague, Sergeant Dalton, was on his way in the police car home, and he gets this call, and he's a Christian, and so he's very compassionate, but he was also on the SWAT team in Northern Ireland during all the bombings, and so I wouldn't mess with him. Um, but he's very gentle, and he loves God, and on the way home, a call came over the radio that said, there's such and such address, anybody near it, there's a nine-year-old trashing a house. And he was near it and took the call, and they said, we're going to send you back up. And he radioed back, and he's a very big guy, and he goes, look, I've got kids, I'm pretty big, I think I can handle it. He goes, now you need backup. And when he got to the house, he realized why. So the screen door was open, or the, the door was open, screen door was shut, but he could see through. When he looked down the hallway, he saw a bathtub with overflowing water and a sink, water all over the place. And he saw a nine-year-old standing over the screwdriver tearing out drywall. And he was overturning everything. He was just going absolutely ballistic. And he overturned, these, that's a mattress, and he's ripping at it. There's a hole in the wall. And he emptied all the closets, and he was just going nuts. And when my colleague, Sergeant Dalton, when he, the kids saw him, he went and he hid up in this cupboard in the top of the, uh, of the closet. To make a long story short, and I'll tell more of it tonight, the only way he could calm this child down, he'd been traveling with me. We'd been traveling together in the police car, and I was doing these lectures. He knew that if he could just get the kid to look at a screen, those fits would stop. Now, that's not the right way to handle it, but in the situation where he's threatening suicide, you do what you got to do. So he said, mate, he said, uh, if you'll come down, I'll watch television with you. Never mind that he just traumatized his mother, trashed the whole house. His little sister was traumatized, but he goes, great. So he helped him down. 
And they didn't have much money in this house, but TV was huge. And the second Nigel turned on the television, a show came on that cognitively that kid had no idea what those adults were talking about, but it calmed him right down. That's not focus. That's chemical mesmerization like Ritalin to calm. It's a stimulant. The reason why I'm telling you that is because your child's brain is it, probably not near that bad. Maybe, but even if it were, your child can be made 100% whole. And that's why I came here to tell you that. 100%. They had to, it, well, let me tell you what happened. Every day after school, he would play Minecraft with his friends because they were poor, didn't have Wi-Fi, so every day from 3 to 6, he would play Minecraft, and this went on forever. And his mother would make him come home at 6 o'clock. And this particular day, he desperately wanted to get to the next level and finish what he was doing, and she said no. And when he got home, he withdrew. He had started having withdrawals. So the ambulance had to come. The fire truck had to come. They had to put him in a psych ward. Minecraft. It's not educational. Far from it. But here's why I came. I'll show you this, and we'll pray, and I'll pick it up tonight. In a weird way, are you glad you came today? Yeah. Or how many of you, if you wouldn't mind to uh, raise your hand and answer to this question, how many of you are thinking of other people that you wish could hear this? You're thinking about, thank you, uh, most everybody. Bring them tonight. Call them up and say, look, I want to take you to coffee. And they'll go, great, and just come by here first. <laughs> Pastor wasn't laughing. All right, don't do that. Or do it and don't tell him. I'm not sure which. But So this is a neuroscience study from a long time ago. And the reason why I'm showing you an old study is because in this particular era, they had discovered that the video games were damaging the brain, overstimulating them. They weren't educational, including the educational ones. And Dr. David Rosenberg at Wayne State University asked a simple question. If we detox these video game addicts, will their brains return to normal? Didn't know. So this is a video clip of one of the many children whose mother's trying to get the video game away from him to put him in the study, and he's not a happy camper. Turn it off now. Stop, Mom. You're still playing. You I said I'm going to watch. I said I'm going to go play outside with John. Now, when I was growing up, that conversation would have never lasted that long. <laughs> but things have changed, and it needs to go back. So they scanned his brain and his brother and sister, and they're normal, but he plays video games. You remember I told you in that animation to, to notice when it turns gray and it stops firing? You see all that gray in his brain? And it's left him as an angry young man. But here's why I came. And tonight I'll give you more nuts and bolts in seminar style. This is why I came, not to condemn you. You are not under condemnation. God is not mad at you or me came here today to throw your lifeline on God's behalf or attempt to. I'm a fairly flawed kind of guy, but I hope that's coming through in some way because this is why God sent me here. They detox this child by sending him off to summer camp and doing terrible things to him. They only let him hike, swim, canoe. <laughs> no screens on Saturday. You know why? Cocaine's bad on Saturday like it is Tuesday. Total detox. Let it clear out of his system. Then after three weeks, they brought him back into the lab to see what was going on. And this is why I came. This is what happened to him. What's in his hand? You probably can't see it, but that's a keyboard and a mouse. He's playing a video game. So what's in his hand? A video game. And he's mad. What's in his hand? That's digital. And that's analog. Remember analog? Remember paper? Remember paper? <laughs> Can we give Jesus a hand clap for wanting to do that for us? I'd like to close in prayer with you. So would you mind standing? And you stay right where you are. Seth, if you wouldn't mind to come to play keyboard for just a few minutes. Thank you. I'm trying to use my manners and not just bark out orders at you. Thanks for smiling. Now I do appreciate the worship team today. I don't know about you, but I sensed the peaceful presence of the Holy Spirit this morning during worship. And I think we need to take that home.
and feast on that instead of social media. How about you? Amen. All week. Here's what I want to do. Just in closing, I would like for dads, priests of the home, to initiate this. But standing right where you are, I'd like for you to just gather your family. And if you're single, uh, you pray as well. If you came and you're visiting and you don't have your family here, that's okay. I don't have mine either. <laughs> um, my wife is somewhere else, but I'm going to pray. But dads, I want you to gather your family and we're going to close in prayer. And what I'd like for dads to do, there's a lot of symbolism when we lift our hands to the Lord. And the one that I want to focus on today is surrender. And if you're willing, and I'm not forcing you to do it, so don't do this if you don't want to, but when we have issues in our lives and we surrender it to the Lord, symbolically we lift our hands like, I give up. And God in favor of what you want to do. This is symbolic. But it shows God something symbolically. And so, Dad, with one arm around your family and one in the air, I'd like for us to surrender, if you're willing to do it, the technology, the things that we've talked about, things we will talk about tonight because we need God's help. But He will help us and He will turn our brains back on. Is that good news? All right, let's close our eyes and let me pray for us. Father, thank You for such a good family that You've given me here. Beth and I are walking away refreshed. God, thank you for this pastor and, and his clear, obvious, and incredible leadership to love these precious people. And I, I feel your heart toward them as well this morning for a brief moment. And God, I pray for these precious family members here today that you will give them not condemnation. That's not what you're about because we're in Christ. Conviction, yes. But right now, God, the grace of God which is the power of God to accomplish what you are asking us to do. And that is refocus our internal spiritual compass on the things that are actually important. And so God, give the, the power that we need, the grace that we need, the tools that we need, the support that we need through the body of Christ, the family of God, to get together and solve these issues together as a family. What a wonderful church that we can take advantage of here that you put together, God. So bless these men, these priests of the home, um, and also for the single moms, Lord. I just my heart's for them. My brother and I grew up that way, and so I, I, I ask your blessing on them too. That that you will provide some strong, godly men to come around and to help with that through the church, to walk through a detox and a refocus on the things that are actually important. And Lord. That presence that we feel now and what we felt during worship this morning, may we carry this with us and it not just be a Sunday thing, but it be a Monday through Saturday thing as well. And we make that a norm in our homes. And that's what we crave. And that's my prayer for my family here today. You can put your hands down. And it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.